Hi guys and welcome to the first ever Lowland League catch up. Today we'll be talking about the goings on in the Scottish Lowland League and today I am joined by Mozart. How are you doing buddy? I'm very good mate, how's yourself? Good, good. Um, I'm pleased that you've joined me today. Obviously this is just our first episode of this. We're going to see how it works out and you know basically give people information on the Lowland League. What are your initial thoughts in the first few games? Well, it's uh, it's been a pretty interesting start, has it? Um, only one team kind of really kicking on and sweeping away everything in front of them. Uh, it's going to be a tight league again, uh, is the first thing that jumps out. And yeah, there's stories all over the place, we've got plenty to talk about. Yeah, I t- totally agree with you, mate. So we obviously touched on one team dominating early on. Obviously, East Cull Bride with the perfect start, three wins out of three. Uh, Craig Malcolm, top scorer, obviously he's got uh, league experience. It, important for teams to have, basically, uh, players with league experience? Oh, definitely. I mean, if you look at their squad this year, uh, the vast, vast majority of them have played SPFL football. And uh, I said, when when they signed up, Malcolm, um, given that he was on loan at the end of last year, I said um, I tweeted it out, and that's probably the best signing any team will make in this league this year. Uh, and one of the people that agreed with me was Michael Moore, uh, the BSE assistant. So that kind of it tells you other teams obviously sat up and took notice of it, you know. Yeah, I mean there is you have seen a lot of that with uh, the sort of Lowland League teams that they are getting some of the maybe the the older um, sort of league players as well as some of the younger guys on loan. So it's pretty good that we're sort of raising the standard of the Lowland League, or uh, certain clubs are helping the Lowland League out. Um, Obviously, there's another team that's sort of undefeated to begin with, Cumber Nold Colts. They obviously had a great result against Kelty and a win against Gala Feridin. Um, what are your thoughts on them? Do you think they they could be decent this season? Yeah, I mean, they were pretty strong early doors last year uh, and they faded off after a while. But they've got guys there that have got talent and they're slightly different and it's mainly a younger squad uh, that they've got. Uh, but they've still got guys with league experience like for example, their captain, Greg Piscazio, uh, played with the likes of Montrose, uh, and he probably could have stayed there if he wanted to, but he chose to drop down and play every week and, and go from there. Uh, and they've got a decent man up front in Sean Brown, uh, who's pretty much guaranteed to put the, the ball in the net, so that's half the battle, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, what really stood out to me was obviously um, the result against Kelty. I think that was... The, that was the sort of telltale sign for me that they might be another team to sort of look out for this season. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. They're obviously at, at Broadwood uh, sharing with Clyde. So is that an actual permanent thing? Or are they working on their own sort of ground? Or Yeah, it's permanent. I think the the way it works, Cumbernauld Coles are actually the main tenant just now. Uh, it's Clyde that are looking to move away yep. and do something themselves. So the Colts are the main, well, renters, I suppose, at the stadium. But it's theirs. Um, kind of for keeps so I think they're pretty comfy there and all their youth teams come through it and it, it just suits them you know yeah I agree um, obviously we do have a lot of other talking points uh, we're speaking about obviously teams that are doing well there's one team uh, well there's a couple of teams uh, that are not really doing so well at the moment we have to really talk about the situation at Selkirk yeah they're you know they're they're struggling at the moment a lot of their first yeah. team have left this season um, there's obviously talk about the postponements of games. The game against Edisport was postponed. I don't think the one against Kelty is going to be postponed, but the league board obviously expects that uh, Selkirk will fulfil their fixtures. Is there any sort of detail you've got more than I've mentioned to sort of give us a bit of a, a deeper insight into the situation? You could tell that obviously they've struggled to bring in uh, the level of player you need for this this season uh, at this this league because getting smacked 10-0 and 8-0 in your first two games tells its own story. Yeah. So I think I think the league and the club have done the right thing, though, uh, letting them get a bit of breathing space, postponing that game, giving them a chance uh, to get kind of ducks in a row. It's, it's quite sad in a way, I mean, when these things happen, because the, the, the people you tend to feel sorry for are obviously the fans because they've not actually had much control in this, yeah. what's happening with their club. And mm-hmm. it's uh, really sort of bad news. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Selkirk's a really good wee club as well. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been down to Yarrow Park, but I have not, no. it's um, it is a cracking wee place 
to go and see a game of football and uh, the locals are all uh, dead friendly as well it's mainly rugby country um, but uh, the, the club itself is a, is a great wee place to visit but yet the most important thing when it comes down to this is the local community and the fans and it, it, none of this is their doing none of this is their fault yeah I've seen a lot of sort of um, from fan comments and more I've seen a lot of, of a lot of people that are willing to help out and volunteer for the club which is always basically what teams and clubs need that you know at this level they obviously need people to help out it's good to see obviously um that there are fans still willing to help the club yeah and it's absolutely not over yet because one of the guys uh david knox who's big in kind of southern football yep um i saw him on twitter the other day saying that they've had a few positive chats in terms of sponsorships and loans and so on uh, so fingers crossed they can kick on and, and get through the season and compete because it, it might only take, what, four or five different players. They just need to try and avoid finishing bottom and they could still stay up. So it, it's by no means a lost cause after two games of the season. No, I did actually see the same tweet. And uh, how does that really work with loans in the Lowlands? Is, do they, is there a certain amount that clubs can actually uh, get on loan or is there is there basically only partial rules when it comes to obviously loans and whatnot as far as i'm aware there's no limit right uh so they could technically get a loan team essentially from like kids from kind of higher up the levels but i might be wrong in that there might be a certain limit on exactly how many guys you can bring in yeah. uh but if they can if they can maybe bring in say what five young guys on loan just as a rough idea and get that kind of built up for local players that are keen to to get themselves in the short window even uh, and say well we can compete at this level we'll get through this season anyone will fancy picking us up because even if you look at Hoyt last year who had a terrible terrible year David McCaughey played for them and he showed up and he Sterling sure gave him a deal this year so there's there's kind of experience there that you can say well if he can do it, so can you. Come in and give yourself a shot instead of just playing amateur. And they might they might be able to pull something together. Well, hopefully that's the case. Um, I did actually try and read up the rules my, myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's it's not really it's maybe a bit too specific for um, for uh, you know an understanding or whatnot. I did actually try and uh, find something on the sort of loans and stuff, but it's mainly. Uh, sort of due to trialists and uh, permanent signings and whatnot. Yeah. So mm. it's we'll wait and see what happens. Obviously, another team that is struggling. I've actually seen them at this season is uh, Whitehill Welfare, who've sacked their manager Gary Small after two games. What are your thoughts on that one? It's a strange one, uh, just purely for the timing. Uh, if you're going to give a guy the whole summer to build a squad, and then all the two games before you think now you've had enough, it just it, I know he, he didn't have a great year last year um, and he'd probably say that by his own admission because uh, I saw a few comments he made at the end of last season saying we need to do better uh, but he totally changed that squad uh, for last campaign like pretty much everyone went out the door he brought in his own guys he's got a lot of contacts in junior football uh, Gary and they, they didn't perform that well but from time to time you saw little glimmers uh, that some better was coming and they've made a decision very, very quickly here, but this is something that you might actually see a bit more now that there's a lot more pressure on these clubs that are middle to low lowland table just now, given that you've got all the East of Scotland clubs who have just come over from the juniors and they're knocking on the door, waiting to move up. And uh, you'll probably see a few more clubs thinking, we need to keep our spot uh, and making changes like this. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Obviously, the competition has probably become so fierce that they are feeling the pressure, especially managers as well as players, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, I was at the White Hill Welfare. First time in Rosewell, a really fantastic community. The only thing is I didn't really know where the ground was to begin with. <laughs> it's uh, kind of hidden away, but I didn't really think much of their squad. They had a, a couple of chances. Obviously, there was a, a big gulf in class. Mm -hmm. um, but... Again, you, I would expect them to be at sort of the lower end of the table, but again, I, similar to your thoughts, I think uh, two two games in, it's probably not ideal. A lot of the sort of new players, it takes time to gel. Um, 
new staff and whatnot as well. So it's it's a, it's a dire situation. But if you know you've kind of really got to understand the the board and that if they obviously didn't see that there was going to be an improvement, then then maybe it's for the best. But we'll, again, another one that we'll have to sort of wait and see what happens with. Yeah, I mean, the other thing with a club of that size, and they are a really well-run club from, from everyone you speak to, is they're not going to have the biggest budget in the world, Whitehill. Uh, yep. So they're going to be limited in who they can actually bring in and who they can attract. So there, there's a level they're going to be able to get to. And when you're in the same league as a team like East Kilbride, it's still got a wee bit of money from when they played Celtic a few years back. Yeah. Uh, Teams like BSC, who obviously had a great year last year and uh, have pushed on East Stirlingshire, are still a big enough name, uh, having just been out the leagues a few years now, and they can attract guys in. You've you obviously got to be realistic with what your aims are. Yep. Yeah, it's completely agreed, mate. Uh, well, speaking of, uh, obviously, uh, the teams that we expect to be higher up, we've kind of touched on, obviously, how good uh, or how how we expect East Kilbride what about Champions Sparrens? Um, they obviously had a really decent Betfred Cup. Yeah. They obviously, a draw against Dumbarton, a 2 2 draw against St Mirren, which I think the club called like their greatest ever result. Um, yeah, how, how do you feel about them? Do you think they're, they're still up there in terms of uh, challenging and maybe winning another title? I think so. I think they'll still be kind of top 3 4. Um, I don't think they're going to win the league again this year, though. Uh, I just think the changes in the. The, uh, the squad that East Kilbride have built up is really, really strong and it will take something really impressive to beat them at this point. Uh, haven't seen them there uh, just uh, just yesterday. But, uh, I mean, you can't rule out Spartans because the way they play, they're, they're quite happy to win games by the odd goal. They've signed up Jack Smith from BSC last season who uh, knows the way to go and he probably gives them a little bit more up front than they got from, uh, from Ross Allen. And uh, yeah, d- they're defensively in midfield really, really strong. So they they build from the back. They're solid. If they get the the goal or two up in in front of you, they can normally kind of hold on, and not not necessarily hold on, but just can control the game. Uh so yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see how they kick on. Uh they've not really lost anyone from that squad that they they wanted to keep, and uh, they've made one or two additions. So they should still be right up there. We were talking about the Bet Fred Cup. Obviously, they had a decent performance. I think they uh, they were eventually put out by Kelly. I think Kelly uh, went to Ainsley Park and beat them three 0 Obviously, that you know SPL club um, and a Lowland club it was probably expected. Do you think having sort of competitive fixtures hindered them uh, going into the league season? I mean, they obviously had a couple of draws with Stirling and Edinburgh uh, to begin the sort of campaign. Do you think mm-hmm. that might have hindered them rather than having maybe friendlies to experiment with the squad and whatnot? Maybe there's, I I guess there's po- pros and cons to it, is there? So the pros are you're getting great experience against teams that are uh, the levels above you, yeah. And uh, they've probably got a wee bit of money in the bank from it as well, uh, because you get a bit of prize money. Uh, I think if I remember rightly, even coming bottom of a bet Fred group, you get seventeen grand in the pocket. So, like you get two grand more for every place, kind of above that you get. Um, so it it'll be good financially for them for the club. Uh, the guys that have been playing the games will have got great experience from it but the downside is it can be a pretty tough in the legs playing those yep. those games and you're usually two games a week with one week off uh, sorry one game off uh, so it's six fixture dates you play five games twice a week uh, and then by the time the Lowland League comes around there's no respite you've just got to get straight back to it and you could be up against a team who's nicely well rested and perfectly prepared and it's going to be a, an uphill battle at that point I was having a conversation kind of similar um, to what we're talking about with uh, someone who had obviously I think he was talking about Kelty Hearts um, I think it's all, in the whole league if you're looking at it I think I suppose it's uh, true in all professional football but it's very difficult for uh, uh, teams I guess to have like the same mentality going into one game than another because you're not exactly going to be um, sort of playing the same way like a sort of mid-table team wouldn't play the same way against East Kilbride that they would with maybe the likes of well, Selkirk at the moment yeah. so it's so it's kind of obviously difficult to um, to sort of adapt I guess because I mean the, 
you know, at that level, I don't think you're probably not going to have like the the reports that you could have higher up. You know, I mean, there's probably no one sort of going to the games and analysing. I'm not actually 100 percent sure. Is is it, does sc- scouts exist at a lot of level? I don't know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you see uh, one or two of them about. It's interesting. I don't actually know that. Um, but yeah, I mean. It's obviously you don't have, I guess you don't have as much information about your opponents that you would probably hire up, uh, you know, SPL and whatnot. Mm. I mean, in terms of scouting, you'll normally see the actual managers and their assistants going to see yep. different games. Like, more often than not, last year when I was in BSC, uh, you, you'd be sitting watching a game and at the time it'd be in Fergus at Selkirk or whatever, just pop in uh, just to see the opponents and so on. Um at the uh, the cup game that BSC played East Stirlingshire at, uh, East Kilbride's gaffer popped in. So you're, you're quite used to seeing them, but they will often send somebody else as well just to get a, a little bit of an idea of what the, the opposition will give them. Yeah, that's interesting, because I didn't actually know about that, um, if that was the case or not. But yeah, definitely always uh, difficult in terms of uh, judging opposition uh, based on the fact that there's probably less information compared to maybe just watching a team, you know, on the TV or something like that. Yeah, you know? it's the one thing Kelty Hearts might uh, regret because it's quite easy to watch their highlights. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Actually, I think East Kilbride have a channel as well, so um, but yeah, they're they're, they're quite. Um, I, I think they're quite happy with it at the moment. So. <laughs> So uh, looking at the fixtures at the weekend, I think there's one standout one for me. I think uh, champion Spartans at Dalby. Dalby, I watched them obviously against Kelty in the the opening uh, day of the season. I thought they were quite decent little unit. Uh, Lewis Sloan actually looks a really decent player. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking forward to see how they progress. Um, they, yeah, I was really impressed with them. I think they could possibly be up there. Maybe um, maybe not top three, but certainly you know at least up there fourth, fifth sort of position in the league but yeah for me that's probably the game to look out for at the weekend um what are your thoughts on the weekend's games well being a bsc man it'll be the the gala game i'll be keeping my on uh so down to gala Ferry dean rovers uh for for bsc glasgow and um, just for again into that though what you're saying about dalbiti and um, that's one of the good news stories this year i think because they had a right torrid time last year and it got down to the last game of the season uh, with them and Vela leaving and they were struggling but the year before they had a cracking year so it, it's good to see them bouncing back uh, and fingers crossed they will have a good uh, campaign the whole way through it's, uh, it's another club that's a cracking visit but in terms of the, the gala game they've built a squad that realistically I thought would be challenging for the top half of the table and they've not started too well uh, no they got beat just by Gretna there, um, who again have still got a, a pretty solid outfit. But the way the way Gala were set up, you you kind of thought they had the best squad of all the southern teams, and they might still be gelling. But they've get guys like Sean McCurdy and Phil Addison that have came in from Selkirk. Uh, there's other guys in that squad that you'll recognise instantly as well. They should really be kicking on, and BSC having had a, a draw and a loss, and. Let's just say the one of the harder starts to the season be Sterling and East Kilbride one yep. two, uh, really need to get a win on the board as well um, to to get moving. Uh, given that the club want to challenge for the league this year, so that should be a really interesting one because it's teams that are well, they both need a win to get going. It's certainly, yeah, because Gala uh, similar to um, Selkirk and Whitehill obviously lost their opening three games, so yeah, uh, it could be an interesting one that. Uh, going on, obviously, I will be over in Alloa with yourself um, on the 25th against Kelty. I'm looking forward to it, mate. I think um, Adam, the football nomad's coming as well. So Yeah, yeah. And obviously so, the open invite's there for anyone else if they want to come in and say hello. One thing uh, that sort of puts me off is, especially in the Lowland League, I have to say this because it really put me off going to uh, Cumbernauld Colts. Um, is that going to actual stadium football? I prefer. I've started a sort of preference to go to, you know, maybe the sort of smaller grounds and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know why. Mm. So I think it's just. I don't know. It's in terms of like maybe atmosphere or a bit more banter or something. I don't know. So I'll be interested in uh, going to um, Alawa with you. I'll see how how uh, the Lowland League features and like a, you know, pretty much a, a proper stadium. You know, a, you know, yeah. a, a league stadium basically. So. I mean, Alloa Stadium's a bit in the middle, isn't it? It's, yeah. It is still a local team stadium, 
but obviously you've got the stand and it's a club that's now a championship club. So, yeah. um, like I know exactly what you mean though. Like I love going to see these grounds that are old traditional grounds. Yeah. Like we talked about uh, Whitehall Welfare earlier on the proper grass bowl, and you get the stadium. Um, you've got the, the social club within the stadium ground as well. Love that kind of old school uh, approach to it. And most teams in this level have got that. Uh, but, I mean, you look at the likes of Edgy Sports still share with Annan, so they're at Gallibank. Um, East Stirling share are now at the Falkirk Stadium. So there's a good mix. Uh, and for people that like one or the other, they're always going to find something in this league. Yeah, uh, it's completely agreed. As I say, I think it was just, it's main, mainly uh, probably coming from the juniors mentality. I think you're, mm-hmm. I'm kind of, as you said about Whitehill, obviously, I've, first time visiting uh, Rosewell uh, the other week there. Um, it's It was almost a, a decent feeling. I went to the social club, obviously, and there was um, a gentleman, obviously, I had to write the, the old visitors uh, guest book <laughs> or whatever. So that was... That's often. Uh, I don't think we bother with that in Fife, so <laughs> I, think there's, I think there is one. But so that was a bit of an experience, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, it's always fascinating going to these sort of, as I say, like the you know, uh, not so much stadiums, but just like you know, uh, like historic grounds, really. You know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It'll be interesting. I think. Um, obviously, I think Kelly will win. Obviously, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, well, I'm really. I think I'm, one thing's for sure: it will be a cracking game because it's two teams that haven't had 100% starts, put it that way, and you can't afford to drop too many points with East Coast Pride the way they are. Yeah, definitely not. I think they will probably be... They're probably up there for me, I think. I think they're... I expect them to be champions, really, uh, mm-hmm. looking at the other teams. I think it's just going to be interesting who sort of fills the second, third, fourth, um, because... Uh, is it is it the top four that go into the Iron, uh, the Iron Brew Cup? Yeah, yeah. Well, they made that change uh, this season because they added in the two English teams. So, assuming it stays the same now, the top two get an automatically to the first round, and third and fourth play a, a kind of prelim round, uh, a knockout between themselves. Um, the way it used to be was all four got straight into the first round, uh, but these two English teams coming in have messed it up again. So, God knows, they might invite two teams for Timbuktu next year, and it could be <laughs> something else. But, well, uh, for now, we'll concentrate and see the top four get in. <laughs> Yeah, I think that pretty much wraps up our, our first episode, man. unless you've got anything else you want to add. Uh, I don't think so, other than, obviously, if you've been listening along and you've got any feedback, give us a shout, let us know what you thought. Uh, I think the plan going forward is we're going to try and do this weekly, or at least every couple of weeks anyway, uh, just to well see how the season goes. Um, how about yourself, mate? Is there you want to jump in just before we finish up? Uh, not that I can think at the moment, but certainly... Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing these again. Obviously, with, with your selling that, I really appreciate you. Obviously, uh, chatting with me and whatnot. And ah, thanks for having me yeah. on. Yeah, cool. Brian bud. And a little plug at the very end: if you like BSC and you like football, check their website out. And I've got my football manager save on there if you're into that kind of thing as well. Brian, mate. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs> but no, thanks for having me. We'll catch you next time. So that wraps up our very first Lowland League catch up. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Please don't forget to give us feedback and don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. We want to thank clubs that have allowed us to use their highlights. The support is greatly appreciated. Links will either be in the description or the comment section. Don't worry if your club didn't feature too much in the first episode. We have a full season ahead to talk Lowland League as we look to establish this as a mainstay thing. I have been your host Rampant FM and I'll see you soon.